Please find a Bible this morning and turn to the Gospel of John. Chapter 1 of John's Gospel. Many years ago, someone asked HMS Richards Sr. how to finish the work. His answer, put all the preachers in jail. He said, the only way the work will ever be finished is by the layman. And the layman will never do it so long as the preachers are around. I'd like to go even a step further and say, I believe that not only is the work going to be finished by the membership at large, I think it's going to be finished largely through the influence of our laity, through a love relationship with Christ leading to a loving influence for Christ. Our theme this morning, not our argument, but our influence will finish Christ's work. I want to tell you this morning the story of a man who was the first to follow Jesus, the first to win a convert. So far as we know, he never preached a sermon, never worked a miracle. He was a man who had almost no talent that we would call special. His name was Andrew. He had a famous brother, Simon Peter. So unexceptional was Andrew that you'll almost always find him referred to in the Bible as Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. It's like saying you probably wouldn't remember him at all except the one significant thing about him, the one thing that I can really think of offhand, he did have a famous brother. And so we'll call him Andrew the Ordinary. Now that leads us to a peculiar question that we need to ask of Jesus. Jesus chose just 11 persons to be the pillars of the church, to be the leadership of the church, to take the gospel to the world. 11 disciples, Judas kind of picked himself. And of those 11, Why did he throw away one choice on Andrew? If he was looking for people who were great leaders, why Andrew the ordinary? I think that Jesus chose Andrew for a very important reason. I believe he chose Andrew so that we could know here this morning the tremendous importance and significance of the talent of influence. I think he chose Andrew so that no one in this congregation today will be able to say, oh, there's nothing I can do. Listen, if Andrew could, you can. We would just love to appease our conscience by saying, well, I really don't have any special talents. I just don't have enough gifts or or I'm not good at all up front. Listen, neither was Andrew. Yet Andrew was so important to the work of Christ, he was chosen to be one of the pillars of the church. If Andrew could, you can. And when the nominating committee dials your number next time, don't forget that. If Andrew could, you can. Every Christian influences. My appeal is not that you go out and be an influence. You already are an influence. Everybody who knows that you're a Christian thinks either more or less of Christ for having known you. We all are influences. The problem is, do people think more or do they think less of Jesus because of our influence? 
And so the question is not, are you influencing, but are you influencing for or against? This morning, we'll look at three stories from the life of Andrew the Ordinary. Each one mentions Andrew only briefly. But as we look closely at the part that Andrew plays in each story, we will discover an exceptional gift. Three stories, but only one talent, and that was the talent of influencing others for Christ. Story number one is the story of influence through a changed life. Would you follow along with me? John, the first chapter, verses 40, 41, and 42. John, chapter 1, verses 40 through 42. One of the two which heard John, that's John the Baptist, speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Let's just stop right there. And he brought him to Jesus. I wish I could have been there for that encounter. You see, John and Andrew apparently were disciples of John the Baptist. And they saw Jesus walking by, and John the Baptist pointed Jesus out as the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And so Andrew and John went running to Jesus. And having met the Lord, Andrew right off went running to his brother Simon. And Simon must have taken one look at Andrew. I don't know whether it was a smile on his face or the twinkle in his eye, but he knew that something had happened. And Peter wanted that experience too. The book Desire of Ages says it this way, Andrew sought to impart the joy that filled his heart. How successful have you been in influencing your brother or your sister, your husband or your wife, your children, your neighbor? Listen, if we have been more successful influencing comparative strangers for Christ than those who really know us best, maybe we'd better take a very careful look. We may not have had the Andrew confrontation with Christ. Because when you have really met Christ, those who know you best see the difference. That was the talent of Andrew the Ordinary. So close had he come to Jesus that those who knew him best saw a difference. A pastor told about a series of meetings that he was holding. And a lady came to him one evening after the meeting. She was very much concerned about her husband. She was a church member and he was not. And she said, there's really no excuse for him. He knows all about Christianity. He knows all the beliefs. He'll argue all the doctrines. The trouble of it is, he just has an awful temper. And she began to wax rather eloquent about the terrible temper that her husband had. And finally, she stamped her foot and she said, I get so aggravated with him over his awful temper. Influencing others. I wonder who was influencing whom. But then at the same series of meetings, the pastor gave an altar call. And this was a very specific call. One that invited individuals who would like to accept Christ and join the church to come forward. A young apprentice electrician came down the aisle and he sat in the front pew. Big barrel chested fellow. He'd been a Golden Glove boxer. Well, he'd only been to the meetings a time or two, and the pastor just knew that he hadn't heard him preach enough about all the subjects to make this particular decision to actually make a stand to join the church. And so they got around to his house when he was able to, and the pastor, as he talked with the man, found out that he was completely mistaken about the man's readiness. 
This is the story the young man told. He said, years ago, I went to work as just a young fellow for a logging outfit. And come noon the first day, I noticed all the fellows got their lunch buckets and they sat down in a group, all of them together except for one. He was a Seventh-day Adventist. He took his lunch and he went over and he sat by himself. I wondered, my curiosity kind of arose, what kind of an odd fellow is that? So I was just curious, uh, curious enough, I went over and I sat by him. Why, he wasn't an odd fellow at all. He just didn't want his lunch washed down with foul language and dirty stories. Well, I enjoyed eating with him that day, and so I ate with him the next day and the day after. And we ate together every day at noon, just the two of us. We never really talked much about religion. That subject just didn't come up that much. But we enjoyed visiting, and I began to see him as a really good friend. He was such a good man. He was an honest man. And we became great friends, and how he enjoyed life. You know, the two of us had more fun together than all the rest of the bunch put together. Especially, he said, I shall never forget the day he chased me halfway up the mountain and pulled me back down by my heels. Ah, he continued, I wanted to live it up. I had no interest in religion in those days, but I made up my mind to do one thing. If ever I was going to be a Christian, I wanted to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian like that man. Anybody ever said that about you? Really now, has your life convinced anyone that Christians are kinder, that they're happier, that they're more loving? Nobody, I think, was ever won to Christ by someone he did not like. And we talk a lot about the fact that Christ is going to have to grow character with us in order for us to get to the kingdom. May I suggest he's also going to have to change our personalities within us in order to get the work finished, in order to influence others for Christ. The second story we're going to look at is found in John the sixth chapter. John chapter six. By the way, there were, you know, apparently four who were fishermen together, in business together, who later became disciples. There were Peter and Andrew, as we just talked about. And then there were James and John. And John is the only one of the disciples that thought Andrew was significant enough to tell all three of these stories about his life. You will not find them in any other gospel, in any other place in scripture, only John in his gospel. The gospel writer who knew him best respected him the most. Those who were at a bit of a distance from Andrew had difficulty understanding his exceptional ability, but the one who knew him best, John, understood. The second story is a story of influence through associating in the right circles. John the sixth chapter, verses five to nine. Follow along, please, in your Bibles. John the sixth chapter, verses five to nine. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he knew himself what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may even take a little. One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which has five barley, barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? Do you get the picture? Jesus had been preaching. And when Jesus preached, the disciples liked to gather around at Jesus' feet. They liked to be up on the platform. 
But now the sermon was over. It was way past lunchtime. And there were no handy cafeterias or fast food restaurants available in that day. They hadn't planned a potluck. Jesus was responsive to the physical needs of that mass of people. Philip, what shall we do? Well, you know, whenever the Lord is going to work a miracle, somebody has a calculator handy who is able to prove that it just can't be done. He says, even if we had, what did he say, a hundred penny worth of, of bread, it still wouldn't be enough that everyone could have even a little. That was Philip. And now enter Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Andrew, you see, didn't do so well on the platform. And the point I want to make is that Andrew, who didn't do very well on the platform, instead of sulking, went out and worked where he could work. Andrew did his best work on a one-to-one -one basis. In fact, his talent was even greater than that. He had the gift of getting close to a little boy. How do I know he got close? Well, what could be closer to a little boy about lunchtime than his lunch? And not only did he get to talking about the boy's lunch, not only did Andrew know that the boy had brought a lunch with him, he had seen the lunch. Because he came to Jesus and he said, Lord, there's a boy here that has five loaves made out of barley and two fish that are not very big, just two small fish, Lord. There are some men, you know, that try and befriend children by just patting them on the head, you know, and almost like driving them down into the ground. Andrew had the gift of getting close to the heart of a little boy. Do you have this talent of being humble enough to associate in circles where you can be the most helpful? You see, the trouble of it is our instinct as social climbers is often stronger than our instinct as soul winners. There are some jobs in the church that just aren't significant enough for me. I simply would not do. I want to be where I can be seen and heard. And if I can't be up front or if it's not a board position, then I'm just not going to get involved. We don't have the talent of Andrew to be willing to find whatever our limitations are and say, okay, if this is not my skill, this is not where I need to be. And if it is my skill, even though it's way out on the periphery somewhere, then that's where the Lord will help me succeed. Do you have that talent? Every year comes along, there's a brand new overwhelming need for people to help our boys and girls in the children's divisions of Sabbath school and for pathfinders or adventurers or vacation Bible school, working with the children. But a lot of us think, well, you know, I'll just let some others do that. That's, that's good for somebody else. Church is really, it's for me to be helped, not so much for me to help others. Our young people are always in need, especially of men. What a tremendous gift if you're a person like Andrew that has the ability of getting close to boys and girls. But even when we know that we do have that gift, it seems we're so anxious often to mingle with our peers, to impress those in our own strata, in our own sphere. We don't have the Andrew blood that helps us to reach out to the place, even if it's on the periphery, where our talents can be most effective, most influential for Christ. Story number three. John, again, the 12th chapter. Turn with me to John chapter 12. This is a story of influence through a reputation for knowing Christ. John, the 12th chapter, verses 20 through 22. Follow along, please. John 12, verses 20 to 22. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came, therefore, to Philip, 
which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew. And again, Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. Isn't that interesting? You remember Philip from our last story. He was the one that was sure that the miracle of feeding the 5,000 couldn't be done. But Andrew had introduced a little boy to Jesus. Philip had gotten the message. Now here were some Greeks who wanted to be introduced to Christ. And they came to Philip and Philip racked his brain and he said, I know what I'll do. I'll get Andrew. Oh, what a gift having in our communities the reputation for knowing Christ. Not for being square. Not for forcing our beliefs on others. Not for our long prayers. Not for our long faces. I read in a newspaper years ago on one day. It said, Adventists do not eat meat, use lipstick or jewelry. They don't smoke. They don't drink. They don't dance. Oh, God forbid that that is what an Adventist is. What kind of reputation do Seventh-day Adventists have among your non-Adventist friends? Is an Adventist just an odd, long-faced duck? Or maybe is he somebody that's just no different from anybody else? Wouldn't it be beautiful if when someone is in special need, the neighbors would gather around and say, I know what we'll do. We'll go get Brother Smith or Sister Jones. They'll know how to help. They'll know what to do. Or they'll know how to bring them to Jesus. That was the talent of Andrew. Not our arguments, but our influence will finish Christ's work. What were the results of this simple little talent by this ordinary man? Influence is not a small talent. It should not be taken for granted. Let me take you back briefly through those three stories again. It's the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Nobody really knows he's here. There isn't any network news, no cable news, no newspapers, no internet. How's the word going to be gotten out that the Son of God is here among men? And then 5,000 men, counting women and children, perhaps 10, 15, 20,000 people all together, went home with full stomachs as living proof of the creatorship of Jesus. Perhaps the greatest advertising campaign of all time. Do you think it took very long for the people in Palestine for hundreds of miles around to know about that miracle? There must have been a buzz person to person, just everybody. What? Five loaves and two fishes fed 10,000 people? Incredible miracle. The word must have gotten out like wildfire. Why? Why? Because Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, had brought a little boy to Jesus. Let me take you now to the close of Jesus' ministry. His own people have rejected him. They're about to crucify him. A contract is out on his life. And then here come a group of Greeks. And Jesus was so pleased, he was strengthened to accept the cross because he knew that although his own people would forsake him, There were many around the world who were waiting to hear the story of a crucified, risen, and soon coming Savior. Because Andrew had the reputation of knowing how to bring people to Jesus. John 12, verse 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. Our job is just to lift Jesus up. And he will do the drawing. Let me take you now to Pentecost. I don't know where Andrew was at Pentecost. He's not mentioned in that story at the beginning of Acts. But I have a sneaking suspicion that it was somewhere out on the fringe of the crowd someplace. 
when his brother Peter stood up to preach that tremendous sermon. Thousands were converted in a single day as the Holy Spirit was poured out. And Andrew turned to someone standing next to him and he said, see that preacher up there? That's my brother. I brought him to Jesus. I don't know where you will be when the latter rain falls, but imagine standing in the corner someplace watching God and the Spirit of God move men and women through another person's ministry and be able to say, by the grace of God, I help bring him, I help bring her to Jesus. Acts of the Apostles, page 511. Listen to this, it's so profound. Acts of the Apostles, page 511. The influence of a holy life is the most convincing sermon that can be given in favor of Christianity. Argument, even when unanswerable, may provoke only opposition. But a godly example has a power that it is impossible wholly to resist. Isn't that amazing? A godly example has a power that it is impossible wholly to resist. How can I witness like that? Shall I go back and try now real hard to be a good influence? No, that's going back to works. Andrew's example is so simple. We talked about it at the very beginning. Desire of Ages 139. Andrew sought to impart the joy that filled his heart. If Jesus has filled your heart and life with joy, with peace, It's so easy to share that with somebody else. This is what Jesus has done for me. And lifting up Jesus, Jesus will then draw them to himself. I love the story. We won't take time to turn to it. It's found in Exodus, the 34th chapter. It's a story of Moses when he came down from Sinai after being with God and communing with them on the mountain. It says in verse 29 that he wist not that the skin of his face shone. Two lessons we can learn from that. Number one, although he wasn't aware of it, the people around him were aware that he had been with the Lord. His face shone from the glory of God. If you have been with the Lord, the people whom you meet are going to know it. And then secondly, he didn't know it. I think that many times we are much too aware of our own efforts to influence others for Christ. And when we are too aware of our goodness, it's kind of like I'm a saint and you're a sinner, a holier-than-thou attitude, and that really turns people off to a witness. The most effective Christian witness is probably that of which we are least aware not our arguments, but our influence will finish Christ's work. Christ must change not only our beliefs, not only our habits, not only our character, but I believe our personalities if he's ever going to use us to finish the work. A Seventh-day Adventist lady in the Midwest had a problem. Her problem was her husband. Every night down at the tavern until the wee hours of the morning. One night he and a couple of his cronies were drinking it up at the bar. And they got to arguing. Of all things they chose to argue this night about who had the best wife. And after the other two fellows had given their argument, he brought the flat of his hand down on the bar and he said, I've got the best wife and I will prove it to you. What do you mean you can prove it? Follow me. They went out through the swinging doors and swayed their way down the street until they came to his home. 
He fumbled his way into the front door and he planted his feet at the bottom of the stairs leading up to the bedroom where his wife was asleep. Watch this, guys. Martha, get down here and get me and my friends something to eat. Middle of the night. And his buddies kind of backed off from that staircase wondering what would be coming down. Sure enough, the door opened, and there she stood, wearing the oddest thing for the middle of the night, a smile. They shook their heads. They had never been this drunk before. John, if you'd take your friends into the living room and get comfortable, I could have something for you in a few minutes. Before long, the aroma of warming food, and here she came with a tray. She walked into the living room, her husband sitting on the sofa. The room was now empty, though. What happened to your friends? Uh, well, uh, they decided it was time to go home. And then she saw there were tears in his eyes. She put the tray down on the coffee table, and she sat down beside him. John, whatever's the matter? Martha, how can you be so good to me? when I'm so mean to you. And she preached the sweetest little sermon you ever did hear. She said, John, you know that I'm a Christian. I have the joy of Christ in my heart. I hope to be in heaven, and I'm going to have all the happiness I could ever want. But John, you're not a Christian. And I just want to help you be as happy here as I can help you to be. There was a long pause. Martha, if heaven's going to have people like you, then I want to be there too. That man became a Christian, a deacon in one of our Midwest Seventh-day Adventist churches. We close our worship this morning. Brother, sister, I invite you to a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. The kind of an encounter that Andrew had that will so fill your heart with love and joy and so begin to change even your personality that someday someone somewhere will be able to turn to you and say, if heaven's going to have people like you, then I want to be there too. The soul-winning power of ordinary people under the influence of Jesus. Dear loving Father in heaven, today we would draw near to you Lord, may it be our determination that every day of our lives we will spend some time in thoughtful contemplation of the life of Christ, drawing nearer, 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 blessed Lord, nearer to Jesus. And may that encounter with Jesus inspire in us that joy and that peace and that desire to share that with someone whom we meet, wherever it may be, that we may lift Jesus up and that we will seek to just impart the joy and the peace and the love that you have given us to others. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.